Fans of Medicine for Melancholy, Barry Jenkins' first feature film. Raise your hand if you've seen it. Anyone seen it? All right. <laughs> More people should see it. <laughs> um, and then we we had a dialogue over a number of years, and then we re, we kind of uh, we tried to, we talked about doing different things, and then um, time passed, and um, we we kind of got reacquainted in 2013 because we were at the Telluride Film Festival. We were showing 12 Years a Slave and he has uh, worked at Telluride, had worked at Telluride for a long time and he was actually the moderator of the first public screen that we ever had of that film. So we started talking and he, uh, we started exchanging material and he sent us If Beale Street Could Talk and adapted by James Baldwin and, and Dee Dee and I were like but isn't James Baldwin like the notoriously most difficult estate to ever get any kind of permission from uh, and he said 
yeah, I don't have the rights. <laughs> um, and I remember we read the script, it was very beautiful, and it's, it's, it's quite close to this script, actually. I vividly remember reading it and, and the scene with the two families in the apartment, which goes on like almost art of, like uh, obscenely long, right? Like, like the longest, feels like the longest, most awkward family, uh, two family scene of all time. Um, and so it had a lot of the signature qualities, but um, he didn't have the rights. And he then sent us um, Moonlight, which we were fortunate enough to, to be a part of with him and, um, and, and his producing partner, Adela Romanski. And then after Moonlight, um, this, throughout that process, he had been gaining the trust of the estate. And he talks about it as, a, as like um, dating and marriage, like that when you, you know, if you, you don't go to, you don't, if you feel like you wanna marry somebody, you don't like necessarily say so on the first date. You, you might go through a process of, of gaining trust and, uh, and getting comfortable with somebody. And then over time with the Baldwin estate, who are rightfully protective of the legacy of one of the great authors of the 20th century, if not ever, um, you know, it took a while, but eventually by the time we were done with Moonlight, it, it, it became a possibility. So we, we were lucky enough to be invited uh, to, to work on it with him and, and these amazing artists here. Yeah, well said. Um, so glad you said yes, obviously, as the first feature-length English adaptation of James Baldwin's work, it sort of is going to live on forever as we bring these characters to Shifani to life. So taking it to Stefan and Kiki, I know you guys, um, this is an independent film, so time constraints and money constraints are always a thing. But I'm just curious, you know, you step on, on set and you guys have to be soulmates, more than lovers, more than friends. And I'm sure you guys got months to just develop that friendship, right? <laughs> Screen is the looks that he gives to the camera. These just straight on camera shots that you know either some 
personalized and in the case of Regina seen a mirror or in the case of you guys beneath the glass exactly what they should be giving back to each other and it's great on the screen but I can only imagine as an actor just staring down the barrel of that and caring what that is like and then try and bring like a loving gaze to an inanimate object so I want you guys to sort of bring down me I am maybe that look so great <laughs> <laughs> it definitely takes some getting used to. Um, very, I mean, all of those moments, they're surprises. They just happen in the moment. It's not like it's planned, like, okay, we're gonna have this, you know, direct camera shot today. You know, it just happens. Um, I think Barry describes it as, you know, it's these moments where he feels like the distance between uh, the actor and the character, like, it's, you know, it's minimal. It, it's, it's barely there. And so he wants to, you know, capture all of that. Um, so <laughs> the first, the first couple times it, it did, it just took so many of these two. Um, I think after you know so much about giving and receiving, um, and in those moments you're not really receiving in the same way that, you know, you might be used to, um, but you definitely are giving so much still and living in, you know, these really often, you know, really emotional, painful moments. Um, so it wasn't until actually sitting in the audience and you know, the receiving end of that, that I really recognize the, the power of it. The power of you really having to look at these people, you know, in the eye and acknowledge their pain and their, their trauma and their full humanity. Because um, I mean, even though, you know, these are fictional characters that were playing, they are representative of real people. There are real tissues, there are real bodies. Um, and in those moments, you have to look at these people in the eye and acknowledge their full humanity and knowledge that these people have families that love them and that, you know, they love and, you know, you have to receive all of that. Um, so I definitely recognize the power of it, but in the moment, they definitely took some. So I'm getting used to <laughs> the moment you just like, I got this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird thing, you know. Um, if there's any actors in the audience, you know that we, we do weird things on a daily basis. It's kind of like part of the job. Um, but, you know, I really, to me, it's just like he was saying, it's, it's, it's just a way to, it's what it cuts out the middle man. It allows, you know, the, the audience to become a part of those moments. You know, now the audience is in the film um, as these characters are, are looking directly at them. And, um, and for me, just, from my perspective, management perspective, I think that there's so much, you know, there's so much in, in this novel, the James Bond's novel, that, you know, it takes 20 hours to read a novel, but he wants to spend in a couple of hours. So it's like for, for us as actors, we've got so much um, sort of um, material about the backstories of these characters, the lives and where they're coming from. And, and, and sort of those moments you use as internal, internal dialogue in the brain. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's that idea that, you know, even in, in the most like, silent moments that you can communicate, you know, a thousand words. So I think it's a, a very uh, strong and effective sort of technique. Yeah, and again, the end result is just beautiful and breathtaking and it completely, you know, invests you into every aspect of the story. Um, back to Dee Dee and Jeremy, I feel like the producers, you're kind of like, in the end, as they craft these stories, you guys that sort of help foster that, um, which also means that you have to be the magicians in a lot of ways to make the, the budgets and the locations and everything work. So on this one, I want you guys to maybe tell us one of those moments where you didn't think something that Mary asked for was going to work out, but like, like the blessing still happened, the miracles still happened, they secured the location, this person's schedule became available to where you were able to bring something that you thought you weren't going to the film actually onto the screen. Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, it's more, it's more like, what do you want, Mary, and then I'll, we'll go kill ourselves together. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's sort of a jujitsu act, and, and but it, it but it's comes from the heart. I mean, we were you know um, with her and me in Puerto Rico, we were supposed to shoot, and we had to pivot really fast and um, move that. Uh, obviously, we wanted to shoot in Harlem. It was incredibly important that everyone would do that to honor Mr. Baldwin. I, I don't know. We we're just lucky to be a part of it. And honestly, that's how I feel. I, I think Barry is one of the great humanists and one of the great storytellers of our time. And so to 
to be a small part of it and to create the space for him to find Kiki and Stefan and Nick and everyone else who got involved. That's a, that's a privilege. We feel very privileged. One more little detail. Um, so getting a day for Brian Tyree Henry out of the Atlanta schedule, he worked uh, for you know, just one day's work, um, that incredible scene between Stefan James and, and him, and that was logistically uh, challenging because of the demands of that schedule. And uh, that, that was a, an example of what Didi said about you know, really going the extra mile to, to get Barry the things that he needed. But um, I remember that like, I, I'm, so, I'm so happy that he pushed and that w we all pushed because you guys got to experience that incredible, um, almost mesmerizing, what is that, what the hell is that scene? It's so unbelievable and uh, so strong. So that was, an, that was a little bit of like a production scramble thing. No, that's a great example, again, because like, let's be honest, that's like hitting a home run. You know, we get one back, so it's amazing that that was done in one day. Um, speaking of that scene, um, Nicholas, I want to talk to you about that scene, because again, your score is placed throughout this film, and it's amazing, but I really love what it does um, in that scene in particular. So I just want to ask you on this one. If it wasn't that scene, what was the one that maybe Barry gave you the most notes about? Like, which was the one you had to work really hard to get to that magic moment? <laughs> That's a, it's a great question. I think the Barry is always very clear early on, right when we're starting the work, where there are certain scenes that are going to be tricky. He's like, "That's going to be tough." So just, just keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, one of one of the really tricky sequences was um, when uh, Fani, you know, the sequence where the camera's swinging around, kind of Fani while it's sculpting with smoke in the air, um, and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of ideas I think in the process where you actually can't until you figure out the things out. You know, so in that sense, it's almost like a, you're like a jigsaw puzzle where as you lay the groundwork for certain things, then all of a sudden other ideas kind of reveal themselves. So that was that scene, but the, um, the sequence that, that you first talked about with Daniel and Fani, um, that was really a breakthrough for us because in the beginning, um, there was the Miles Davis Blue and Green that was playing a record player. In the beginning, when I first saw the sequence, that's how it was. I missed the most, and I actually argued very about this. I messed up. 
some of them. Um, was a scene where Fani brings Tish um, home and, and asks to, to take her hand in marriage, she asks to marry her. And, um, you know, to Darren's thought that scene was important because it showed, like, I don't know, this, like, young man who was struggling with the, you know, wanting to, to be respectful and, and um, you know, knowing, you, knowing what he's done and knowing what he's had. You know, to shout out this late and to bring her home and, and, and to say, well, listen, you know, I'm taking her money now. Like, it's going to be my woman, um, <laughs> you know, my wife, and, um, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life with her. I think that that's just so exemplary of, of their love, this, this true love between soulmates that's, that's existed since they were children. And, um, and yeah, I think that, you know, hopefully you guys have a sense of that even without that scene. the cast is stacked top to bottom with great talent. I just want to know a little bit about what the casting process was and how you found everybody that you did find. And then maybe for the actors, you know, what your reaction was when you found out that you got your roles. Okay, so the question was how the casting together and the actors of the film, um, how you found out that you got the role. Um, it was Thank you. 
and kind of seeing the, the um, past that we go to lunch with me and you can read much of us sometimes. So we had a little lunch and you sort of explain, you know, what the film that you wanted to paint, the story that you wanted to tell. And, um, you know, I don't think that he was completely convinced that I was fine. Um, you know, I told myself it wasn't going to be this restaurant until he was. So I said, I said, Mary, I'll take care of every single scene in the film for you if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, after we left that lunch, um, you know, he, he called me like a few days later and told me he was going to offer me the part. Of course, I was just overjoyed and, and, and nervous and excited all, all in the same breath. That's great. Um, anyone else? Okay, right here, second. Yeah. Um, I was Two and a half of which 
is said in solitary confinement as a 16 year old boy. And for me, just seeing his, his story and you know, I, I watched a documentary on him. Um, you know, I had to look at this young man in the eyes, just like you guys had to look Sonny in the eyes and come to terms with what it is this young man was going through. You know, these young men, you know, Fani is so representative of, of really a million young men who are going through the same ordeal across this country. And for me, it meant a lot to give a voice to these young men who are often voiceless. You will never ever get to see their story. You will never ever get to see the fact that they love people, the fact that they have people who love them back, the fact that maybe they have children that are about to come into this world. And that that very thing was being threatened on a daily basis. The fact that these walls, the walls of these prisons are meant to physically and mentally break these young men. You know, regardless of, of, of knowing the shoes behind why they're in there in the first place. And to be a fly on the wall in those situations, to see what that looks like, to see what it looks like to have to, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm so sorry, so we actually have to wrap. We'll come back afterwards, okay? I promise. You can maybe run over afterwards. Um, go ahead. It's okay. I just want to mention my second. It's just, it, it's really about giving a level of, of humanity to these characters. So I couldn't, as hard as it was for you to look at you, believe I had to sit with that and, and to understand that that's a very real thing and it's affecting so many young men uh, across this country. So, um, you know, if I wasn't, if I wasn't bringing it out of the map to find it, I wasn't doing my